Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Copernicus Festival and we continue our meeting with Professor Antonio Damasio. Uh, we, will, we will have a talk entitled Descartes Error. This, of course, is uh, the title of your best-selling book. Uh, and uh, in order to sum it up, I would say that it is concerned with two interrelated problems, two problems I would like to speak with you about. Uh, the first is emotions and rationality, the question whether emotions are rational or they are purely irrational. And the second is uh, the Descartes error, the mind-body problem and the way Descartes uh, conceived uh, uh, it. So uh, let us begin with the first uh, question, the question about the rationality and emotions. Uh, and let me start with a quotation uh, uh, from a little treaty uh, entitled uh, Passions of the Soul uh, by Thomas Wright, uh, written in 1603. He says about emotions, they are called perturbations for that they trouble wonderfully the soul, corrupting the judgment and seducing the will, inducing for the most part to vice and commonly withdrawing from virtue. And therefore, some call them maladies or source of the soul. I believe this is something which many of us have experienced, that when we experience very strong emotions, our rationality suffers in one way or another. Are we right to think in this way or are we mistaken? Okay, first of all, thank you. Thank you again <coughs> for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, Bartek, uh, answer to your, to your question. I think it's both. I think you, you cannot um, dismiss emotions simply by saying that they are rational or they are irrational. Even the same kind of emotion may turn out to be quite helpful and rational in certain circumstances and be terrible in others. Uh, what we need is to realize that they are, to begin with, um, patterns of behavior that are reasonably fixed, but not fixed in a stereotyped way. So we don't have the same joy, the same sadness over and over again, although we can all recognize in others certain reactions and that's the reason why people can say so and so is sad or unhappy and so and so is angry so th th there's certain parts of the pattern that fit and that allow us to make the diagnosis which is the reason that i i find it a little bit extreme when some people complain about uh, um, so an essentialism of the emotions and say well it's it's not, there are no fixed patterns. Well, there are no fixed patterns, but they're things that are extremely similar and that allow us to recognize emotions across the board. And, and we do all the time. And that's the reason why actors can mimic certain emotions and we will recognize those emotions and be part of our understanding of a certain situation. But that, that pattern of behavior came not because we wanted it to be in a certain way or that we invented it. It came to be by a process of selection over biological evolution. And they are there in a very specific manner because they were helpful. So to begin with, whether they are slightly irrational or very rational in the day-to-day -day circumstances for you or for me, is no concern of biology. You know, evolutionary, uh, the evolutionary process kept them there because by and large, they happen to be advantageous for the creatures that had them, and that's why we're all still here to tell it. Um, so in certain circumstances, again, I go back to the example of anger, 
uh, and this is something that is interesting, especially now, because in the social and political moment, there is so much anger. Whichever country you're talking about uh, that is having elections or is having economic problems, one of the things that surfaces in the discourse very frequently is anger. Party X uh, says that we are extremely angry at so-and-so for doing this. We're angry at globalization, or we're angry at the European Parliament, or we're angry at uh, uh, overregulation and so forth. So there's this pattern of anger, and one wonders, is this helpful? Um, well, it doesn't seem like the most intelligent way of dealing with it. And I would say that it's one of those reactions that is understandable, but not is an example of not the optimal rationality, because it would be much better if we would say, okay, this is disappointing, let's find an interesting, intellectually, uh, reasonably drawn way in which we can solve the problem. Yeah. But um, maybe we, we should rephrase the problem, because when we think of the philosophical ways of understanding rationality, there are two different approaches to the problem. The first one is to create some very high standard uh, of rational behavior, uh, of rational choosing. Uh, for example, uh, the entire classical economics is based uh, on the idea that uh, people are or should be utility maximizers. So they should uh, act in such a way that they always maximize their profits and minimize their, their losses. And of course, from this perspective, I believe, emotions uh, uh, lead us to decisions which may not meet this particular standard of rationality. But philosophers also speak of a different kind of rationality, of uh, which di is displayed best when we think of how an organism is fit to survive in a given environment. And this is the so-called ecological rationality. So maybe we should rather say that uh, if we think of the rationality of emotions, uh, whether they are rational or not, we should think in terms of the, this ecological rationality of how well it uh, makes uh, the, an organism act in an environment yeah. rather than this constructivist or this very high standard of rational a behavior. Absolutely, I entirely agree with you. I think that the, 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 the best solution is whatever works. And in some cases, I mean, the, 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 the problems are not all the same. So in some circumstances, that's exactly the best way of approaching it. And, um, and, and being as flexible, you know, that there's something uh, on the side of rationality, there's another concept that is, I think is very important, which is the concept of reasonableness. You know, one thing is being rational, another thing is being reasonable. And, and reasonableness is extremely helpful in guiding behavior. But you have to realize that the, the, the the different circumstances in which we behave with an emotional component is huge. And uh, emotions can be dragged into the, pro and are dragged into the process more often than not. And the, the, the range of them, you know, in a way, uh, you know, you, you have chosen to have the Ekman uh, expressions of emotion very prominent uh, in, your, in your posters, which is a good idea because they actually connect very well with Darwin, uh, who first thought of them, but the fact is that the range is much larger than that. It's not infinite. It's infinite in the gradations, but you, you have a huge range of, of sort of pre-prepared uh, emotional reactions. Yeah, and uh, this leads me to another question about the mechanisms, emotion-based mechanisms, uh, which help us to deal with the environment and with other people. And of course, you are quite famous for uh, a theory, uh, the so-called uh, somatic marker hypothesis, uh, which uh, I believe you and other people connect with the workings of the human intuition. So uh, may, may you say a few words first about the, the hypothesis itself, and then I would like to uh, discuss the problem of intuition and how emotions help us to intuitively adapt to the circumstances which we meet in our daily lives. 
Right, so it, uh, intuition is actually something very interesting because it certainly is can be connected with with e emotion. We, but it, it also can be connected with some concept with a concept that is not very much in fashion, which is the concept of big data. This is something that comes from developments in in computational uh, neuroscience and in artificial intelligence and their applications. Um, and it, it's the idea that you sweep huge amounts of data that have been stored and out of certain patterns, that certain regularities in those patterns, you come up with certain, um, with certain ideas. And those ideas have the, the, the flavor of intuition, which is a sort of guess that that may be something. Uh, and intuition is, is this uh, way in which we, we sweep constantly I in our mind stores uh, about things that we have lived through uh, and things that we have imagined because we're constantly prospecting uh, about what is going to be tomorrow or in my case, when am I going to have a glass of wine tonight and things of that sort. And intuition is what happens when you say, ha ha, it may be X. Um, and so it's a, an extremely important uh, problem. Now, does intuition relate to semantic marker hypotheses? In a way, yes. Uh, the, the when, when we thought about semantic marker hypotheses, we actually thought it was too complicated to, to summarize, but it had to do with the results that we had in patients uh, and the ways in which they thought about problems. But it's very simple. It's, it's about ha having a signal which is fundamentally emotive and is telling you that the organism, which really means, in this case, the, the, the brain working with the organism, recognizes something that may go in a certain direction. This afternoon, the, when we were meeting with the students, the students asked about this. <coughs> and I said, the, the <coughs> should one trust semantic markers? Well, you know, it, it's having same thing as walking into a room. I gave this example. You walk into a room and you sense that something is not going to work right. Or on the contrary, you sense, I feel well here, it's going to work well. Which, by the way, if you have to lecture, it happens all the time. You know, you may walk into a room and you and you look at people and you feel well to be there and you want to start talking. Or you may walk into a room and say, my God, what am I doing here? Not the case here, <laughs> uh, on the contrary. So what is that? What it is, is that your brain, rather than going one by one, collecting information, your brain is actually working very fast and collecting a lot of dominant information from people, from a room, from whatever, the architecture, the lights, you name it. And all of those things produce a certain emotive state that you then read out as being positive or negative. That's what a semantic marker is. It's the, the natural readout of your state as induced by a certain by a certain situation. And it may be that it's a good readout and that you, that your, your brain, in other words, your organism, detects something in the environment that is potentially dangerous or, on the contrary, detects something in the environment that is beautiful and that makes you feel well. And then it's up to you to either heed the advice or not. You may sit on the advice and say, the hell with it, I don't care. Or you may say, hmm, this is interesting, let me think about it. And this is how one normally leads life. You're constantly listening to this. Uh, and the more you're able to listen to these signals, the more you're actually able to mature an attitude which is to regard them in certain circumstances and disregard them in other circumstances. And that, that's, that, that's part of our process of maturation. And it can lead you into very wrong things, you know. It can lead you, for example, into walking into a room and being superstitious because 
you walked on the wrong side. And that's bad. You, you obviously don't want to be limited that way. But it may give you very good information. I, have the, I think that there is a very important point here, uh, which I think you very well summarized in one passage in the introduction to Descartes' error. Uh, you say that the quality of one's intuition depends on how well we have reasoned in the past, on how well we have classified the events of our past experience in relation to the emotions that preceded and followed them, and also on how well we have reflected on the successes and failures of our past intuitions. Beautiful. I Whoever wrote that was very smart. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly... I, ha I have the name here, I can tell you later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, 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 but you know... Bartek, yeah. let me just interrupt because that's exactly it and that's why it goes back to the point that I was making at the beginning. This is not a matter of preferring emotions and feelings over intellect. It's both. The, the more you <coughs> educate your life in terms of feeling and connection to the, the reality you can appreciate, the better the better advice you're going to get. Yeah, uh, let me check whether, whether I understand it well or not. Uh, you, you, for do, instance, you do. <laughs> for instance, when you think of uh, uh, doctors or lawyers, yeah. in, in legal philosophy there is a famous theory of the so-called hunch. Uh, uh, and this is a kind of the faculty of mind very close to intuition which characterizes good judges. I think the same may be said of, 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 of doctors, that a good doctor is someone who has th the kind of training that makes him intuitively react in, in the proper way. Yeah. So uh, it's not only in our daily lives, but to become an expert in a field uh, requires training, requires a lot of experience, but uh, this is expressed in the way we intuit things, so we, we intuitively decide and when facing a problem. Entirely agree, I think you, you absolutely touched on something very important, which is by the way one of the things that has been a limit to the success of certain forms of artificial intelligence is that they lack, they have lacked so far that possibility. So there's that, that element of educated uh, hunch is missing. Although th that's one of the things that people in Silicon Valley are trying very hard to, to substitute. In fact, there was some, for example, in the, the, the recent successes of, of Go, uh, of the program that played Go uh, with, the, with the champion of Go, uh, there, was, there were things that were very surprising for the champion, the human champion, uh, because it sort of mimicked hunches and that this obviously is a progress which doesn't mean that it's going to go anywhere human but but at, at least it was a step in that direction well, if, if I remember well uh, when deep blue won with Kasparov uh, Douglas Hofstetter uh, said that it well this fact speaks to the nature of chess as a game not to the nature of human intelligence pretty smart comment well, uh, if, if I wanted to sum up this part of our discussion about the uh, human rationality and the role of emotions, uh, I, I, I'm forced to ask the question, would human rationality be possible without emotions? Can you imagine such an evolutionary scenario? No, no, and I think that, I, I would say definitely not, and I think that what characterizes human rationality is precisely the fact that is a, a negotiated process between the part that has to do with feelings, which has to do with homeostasis, with the, in which comes from early life, with the part that was acquired once we were expressing computational aspects of uh, you know, intellectual operation. And it, it's that marriage that makes that makes um, our humanity, that, mar that, that, that marriage that is, in which by the way, one, one identifies very naturally as human beings. We identify it we, when we have people that are, say, our leaders in, in a sociopolitical context that don't have that, it's, it's clearly recognizable. So uh, it was in a different context, but David Hume once said that reason is the slave of the passions. 
uh, from what I understand, you wouldn't say, well, this is exactly true. Uh, rather, we should look for a kind of homeostasis in the system, the balance between emotions and what we call rationality, and this is what makes us yeah, human. I think the, 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 the concept of negotiation between those parts, I think, is an important one. Yep. Okay. So if you allow me, we will move to the second problem, uh, which is the mind-body dualism, okay. or the Descartes error. And let me quote Descartes first. Uh, in the Discours de la méthode, he says, from that I knew that, that, that I was a substance, the whole essence or nature of which is to think, and that for its existence there is no need of any place, nor does it depend on any material thing. So that this line, that is to say, the soul by which I am what I am, is entirely distinct from body, and is even more easy to know than is the latter. And even if body were not, the soul would not cease to be what it is. And now, if you allow me, a second quotation from an unknown author of Descartes' error, uh, who says, this is Descartes' error, the abyssal separation between body and mind, between the sizable, dimensioned, mechanically operated, infinitely divisible body stuff, on the one hand, and the unsizable, undimensioned, unpushed palable, non-divisible mind stuff. The suggestion that reasoning and moral judgment and the suffering that comes from physical pain or emotional upheaval might exist separately from the body, specifically the separation of the most refined operations of mind from the structure and operation of a biological organism. Which one do you choose as your or <laughs> this? The, the second for sure. And why? Well, first in relation to, to Descartes, uh, I think we should make clear that um, the, in, in relation to great thinkers, philosophers or not, it doesn't make any difference, um, my, my, my reaction is that even if there are things that are egregiously wrong, uh, it's a great fortune and we should be very thankful that they wrote it. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't write correct things all the time. Sometimes we write, sometimes we're not. And I have great admiration for Descartes, actually, and I, I have the same way that I have great admiration for Spinoza. And that doesn't mean that I find what Spinoza wrote all the time great, or what Descartes wrote all the time great. But I have to say that when, when Descartes wrote what he was writing, there are two ways in which you can explain it. One is that he was smoking something that he shouldn't, uh, but maybe not. Uh, the other is that he was trying to accommodate his thinking, or at least the expression of his thinking, to what he expected other people uh, that had influence over him in terms of power and money, um, and he was trying to satisfy them. And I think that it's actually the, the, the latter that counts. He was part of a certain time and a certain setting, and it would have been inconvenient uh, politically and socially to say what he thought. Because at other times in the life of Descartes, he thought things that were very different from that, as, as, as you well know. Uh, so, of course, he could have evolved. We evolved, we changed. You know, I, you know, some of the things that I told you tonight are things that if I go back 20 years, I know that I didn't think that way. Um, so it's a good thing that we change, and it could have changed. But I have a suspicion that there were other things going on. And then all those, those morning trips that he had to take at 6 in the morning to cross. Uh, I mean, for those of you who have been in Stockholm um, in the winter, you know it's a cold place. There are winds, and there's a lot of humidity, and there's water everywhere. It's very beautiful, but there's a lot of water. And the poor man was in charge of instructing this young uh, queen, uh, who was, I think, 16 years of age, and who liked to be taught at around 6 a.m. Now, 6 a.m. in winter in Stockholm is, is quite a task. And to cross from where he lived, to the palace, which is still the same palace that you find in the very center of Stockholm, 
uh, was quite something. So I have the impression that his brain was a little bit frozen uh, by that time. And, of course, so much so that he actually died in the process because he died exactly on one of those trips to the palace. And um, so I'm trying to make a, a joke, but I'm serious. Too. Yeah. Uh, let me just say that I, I, I wish you a, a journey to Stockholm in early winter sometime. <laughs> oh, uh, I love Stockholm in winter. Oh, I have something more celebrational in mind. Uh, uh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's a beautiful place and to, to, to have, um, you know, I, I, I love Stockholm in winter and in summer. In June, in June you have this, these days that never end and there's no night. And um, in winter, of course, at three o'clock, in the afternoon, the sun sets, and then it only comes up <laughs> the next day and very, very late. But <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, Descartes was wrong. Many philosophers were wrong, m m most yeah. of them, really. Most of them. Maybe e uh, every philosopher. And, and neuroscientists. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, you know, what's the problem? They all were, were wrong in one way or another. Uh, what, well, why this particular error? is so important to spot and... Yeah. Uh, Very good, yes, yeah. got it. So I think that here the, the, the issue in that, I think that uh, I have not changed in the 20 some years since uh, Descartes' era, and uh, in fact I talked about it tonight, except I know far more than I did then, is that it is not reasonable to think about a process such as the process of our minds without the biology behind it. Um, it it's our organisms and our evolution that invented this thing. And what people do when you, you create artificial intelligence is precisely that. It's an artificial copy of some aspects of our mind. But the invention comes from the biology. Th th it's the biology that did it for us and it's hooked on the life process and it's not the brain alone. It's the brain in this incredible cooperation with the organism because probably the best way of saying it, which is the way I'm saying it right now, don't think of the brain as the top of the, the stuff in your life. The brain is a servant of the body. The brain serves the life process. If we want to think teleologically in terms of evolution, why do we have brains? Well, we have brains because once we were multicellular organisms, as complex as we would be, it was not possible to run the system and to operate the system efficiently without a master coordinator. And that's what nervous systems are. So nervous systems arise when you have the first creatures that develop nervous systems in the Precambrian period, that creatures called Cnidarians, and they have what is called nerve nets. You know, it's these little uh, nerves crisscrossing each other. They look a lot like what we have in our reticular formation. We still preserve in the depth of our brain stem and part of the spinal cord the kind of organization that was present in those creatures. There were nothing like beyond floating hydras, it was like floating digestive tubes, and they had that organization. Okay, they already, they were multicellular, and they were already developing needs to have a system that would coordinate their operations. Why? Because they needed to coordinate motility, they need to move towards food sources, they need to coordinate the basic process of digestion and they needed to defend themselves and move around. So although these things can be done without a nervous system, if you have a nervous system, they're done more efficiently. This is also the same reason why we developed circulation and immune systems. It's what I like to call whole, whole organism systems. Circulation, what is circulation? Circulation is the, the Amazon of, uh, of biology. It's a system to deliver the goods and to collect the garbage and throw it away. And immune systems are absolutely essential because they have to defend us in general as an organism. And, and uh, when you add 
immune systems, circulation, and then you have the nervous systems. And what they do is create this coordination of movements and fundamental operations. And as it gets more and more complex, guess what? It develops the possibility of generating maps. Probably the maps and images don't start out for us to um, you know, be great painters or great novelists or filmmakers. It starts out to provide information on a target. So why would that be an advantage? If you're an organism and if you need to attack here on the zero, if you have a guide to that, you can attack on the zero rather than just attacking like this and going by chance. So nervous systems created minds as a, a byproduct of creating efficiency in movement. And that's why it came to be what it is. But there are science fiction stories which <coughs> suggest another possibility. Uh, one of them was, I think, first created by uh, a great Polish science fiction writer, Stanisław Lem, in a short story published in 1961, entitled Professor Corcoran, <coughs> but, and then repeated, unknowingly probably, by Hilary Putnam in his famous uh, paper brains in a vat. The idea is that there is this crazy scientist who takes out your brain, puts it in a vat, connects it to a supercomputer, and the computer generates signals which in your brain create an illusion of reality. From what I understand, do you think this is impossible? I, I think it is impossible. I think it's, it's impossible, it's misleading, it's misinformed. And I don't think there's anything in the biology that suggests that, which is also one of the reasons why uh, uh, a lot of the so-called transhumanism and singularity and other such things uh, has any basis in reality. So the idea that we have a brain that we can download into a computer, I, I think, is fiction. The problem is that it's bad fiction because it just can't happen the way, the way we know it. Now, um, you can download lots of other signals, uh, lots of signals, but to, to convince anybody that that would be like your mind is actually wrong. It does not yeah. conform <coughs> to the science we, we, we have. Yeah. But it indeed is uh, an important debate right now mm -hmm. uh, whether artificial intelligences can ever become a part of our society in one way or another, uh, whether they can only mimic uh, our reactions, but uh, this would be based on a completely different mechanisms, or we can design such machines which would uh, not only emulate us, but be like us. And in this context, Daniel Dennett uh, says that we should probably start developing emotional algorithms. What do you think about that idea? Well, I think that th that actually that it's a very complicated question and it has plenty of answers. First, the, the, the notion of the emotional algorithms, that's perfectly fine. They are, in fact, being developed. Um, but remember the thing that I said in the talk let's not confuse emotions, which are action programs, with feelings, which are experiences. That's a fundamental distinction. If you're talking about consciousness, you're talking about subjectivity, you're talking about the private impression that everyone in this room has about the world and about she or himself, okay? That is the world of feeling, that's the world of subjectivity. Can we generate a world of subjectivity in an artificial intelligence gizmo? Yes, I think you can, but there's no, it's not just guarantee, there's nothing indicating that it will be like ours. So I can perfectly well design for you, I can tell you the ingredients that I would use. And this is something that actually in our lab we're doing, and there's several people that work on artificial intelligence that are designing 
schemas for constructing something that would deliver quote unquote feeling. Provided you understand that the feeling is no reason to be like your feelings or mine. Why? Because our feelings are based on the very nature of our chemistry and biology. It's really about our process and about our organism with the structures that we have. That's what's being, you know, feelings are multidimensional, uh, coordinated imaging processes of the interior of your organism. And by the way, it's actually a very restricted interior. All it takes is the organs that are in the chest and in the abdomen and in certain aspects of the largest of the viscera, which is the, the skin. That's it. You don't need to image many other things. But unless you produce the equivalence of those things in the artificial uh, uh, creature, why should the feeling be the same? There's no principled reason why you should expect the same thing. It should be a different thing. But formally, it can be the same thing. And, and, and my, my, my claim is always that you can formally create a system that is comparable, that has the same characteristics, but not if the, 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 the in other words, the substrate is essential, which is the reason why I'm, I'm very sad when I see people saying, well, you know, the brains are algorithms and uh, it's all a question of finding the right algorithm. Well, it's not. You know, the idea, of course, the, 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 there's, a, there's nothing wrong with describing uh, biological processes algorithmically. Of course, there are aspects that are, can be captured by algorithms. But the issue is that when you talk about algorithms, you give the impression that the context and the substrate are dispensable, but they're not. You know, we, we operate algorithmically on a substrate that happens to be our own carbon-based life. <coughs> but when we think of defining in this or capturing in one way or another the human nature, the, yeah. the essence of humanity, uh, I think we should also think of, of the non-human primates. Because yeah. probably their, the the, surely the organization of their bodies, their nervous system is quite similar to ours. Uh, can you tell us wh what do you think distinguishes them from the human beings? Yeah, well, I, I, I actually... I, I talked about several of these exceptional features uh, during the talk. Well, one which is obviously is the scope of our intellect, which I think is uh, considerably wider. The other is the scope of the memory. You know, the, the memory, the, 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 the space of our memory is just huge. Um, and it's both in the, in the backward direction and in the forward direction. And there are more and more things being discovered about memory, uh, including, for example, something that has a lot to do with, with the emotions and feelings, the fact that stress is an extremely important factor in the quality of the memory. The more stress you have, the less memory you're going to have. Uh, and stress actually affects new neurogenesis, which is a property that is very much tied. It, it means I won't remember anything from this evening. Uh, you will, you will. You're not stressed. You're having a good time. Uh, the, we're all having a good time. Uh, so we'll remember everything. Um, but so memory is, 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 is very different. And then you have language, you know, which is obviously a, a very particular gift that opened up, you know, it, it sort of created a whole new tier of operations because everything that happens non-verbally in our brains can, in principle, be translated in another language. And, and that is the, the scope of it, the distance is, is, is tremendous. So it is intelligence, memory, and language. Yeah, well, those, those three would be very important. What is shared, actually, is life and feeling systems. Yeah. So that, 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 that part. And what, what is interesting in this discussion uh, is that we're calling attention to, let, let, let's call attention to the feeling system so that we have a connection to the life process and to how that can be the governor of the process. But in the end, the realization of what is human 
depends on intelligence, very often depends on language, depends on the capacity uh, of, 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 of memory. Without it, you would, we would not be creative in the proper sense. Well, I think it's a good moment to give our audience the chance to ask you a few questions. Okay. O, if they are asked, you can also ask, bo możecie Państwo zadawać te pytania także po polsku. W takiej sytuacji zostaną Panu Profesorowi przetłumaczone. Czekam na zgłoszenia. Działa. Ja po polsku może spytam, prosiłbym o przetłumaczenie. Jeżeli można mówić o właśnie racjonalności i emocjach jako o dwóch nie wiem, funkcjach ludzkiej psychiki, i czasem się zdarza tak, że one są do siebie w kontrze, na przykład w przypadku nałogów, że emocje nam mówią, że chcielibyśmy coś zrobić, a rozum mówi, żebyśmy tego nie chcieli. I teraz tak, czy trzeba założyć, że jest jakaś trzecia siła, która jakby negocjuje, czy podejmuje decyzję? Bo zawsze podejmujemy decyzję w tą albo we w tą i <śmiech> jakby próbuję zrozumieć, jaka część aparatu psychicznego decyduje właśnie o tym, o tym wyborze. Jeszcze jedno, czy ona jest bardziej racjonalna czy emocjonalna? Okay, so um, if I understood the, the, the question is, obviously sometimes we, we, we think about a problem and we're trying to decide in one way or another, one way that is more emotional, another way that is more rational, and uh, I think the, the, the what is there, and that's actually a very interesting question, is there a third power that would be able to make that decision for us? No, I think the third power is part of one of the powers, which is reason, knowledge, reflection, discernment. So, uh, again, going back to the idea of educating our processes, uh, and which is the reason why I, I want to make a, a, a plea for education in this whole process. If there's something that human beings are suffering from right now is not having sufficiently strong mechanisms of education, not only the education that you get in school, you know, primary and secondary schools or in universities, but having the regular education of knowing about social affairs, in knowing how to think through social affairs without being uh, guided by social media or by cheap entertainment-oriented uh, outlets. We need to think through the problems, and that can only be acquired by a continued effort of education, which is, of course, the mark of civilization, okay? And it's, that is the third power. It's the part of our educated systems that can help us decide between A or B and help us fly above what may be an impulse to be angry or violent or dismissive about somebody else. Okay, thank you. Very good question. Another question right there? Boa noite de novo. Eu gostava de, de I would like to have a, a different version of the question I, I, I tried from you before. Uh, you were telling me that uh, if we didn't have problems uh, speaking about art creators, maybe we wouldn't need to create as much. Um, I, I, I don't think I can fully agree with that because uh, through the history of art we have uh, fortunate people that uh, were provided with everything they could need for their survival and, and, and they, they felt the need to create something else and then we have other people that didn't have nothing, almost extreme poverty and they, they almost forgot what they should do for their survival and focus uh, almost purely in the creation of whatever object of ecstatic or uh, 
so basically this is, is, is my question. Right. Thank so you. So I think that what, what, what you are describing or what you're pointing to is the extremely varied landscape um, within which you can create art or for that matter invent lots of other things that are part and parcel of what our cultures are famous for. And the arts are a very good example. Uh, the, the arts are, you know, they appear, it, it really depends on, on the context. Uh, when you were, th 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 let me tell you about something that sometimes I like to imagine. Suppose you are 50,000 years ago and you are in a cave, sort of like Lascaux, and uh, you, you are a group of humans and that group of humans has a certain number of problems that have to do with uh, survival and have to do with human relationships, have to do potentially with war against other relatively small groups, and may have to do with a very simple situation of either being in, in suffering because of the loss of another, or wanting to seduce another. All of these are possible human situations. And what I would like to say is that all of these situations can potentially serve as the motors behind art. There's great art that was made in relation to going to war. There's great art that was made for the purpose of seducing another person. And I'm talking about seduction not just intellectual, but physical, sexual. There's great art that was created to console other people that were suffering. Uh, and uh, there's great art that was created just for the purpose of recording what was going on. You know, great mural paintings are like that. But when you find in, in caves uh, of sort of middle and southern Europe, when you find uh, flutes with five holes, you know that those people were trying something that was actually music. They were putting tones together and they were putting tones at different points in scales and they were using them for something. And I suspect that what they were using it for was probably seduction or consolation. So all of these, it's, it's hugely vast, the territory of, of creativity. Uh, and it's so, it, it's so vast, you know, it starts with music and painting, which I think were probably the, the original arts, and uh, now includes uh, writing novels and making films and, uh, and all other sorts of arts that have erupted in between. So I, I would not confine it to one solution alone. In other words, the idea that people, if they are satisfied sexually, they cannot write art. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. You know, there, there, are many, there are many ways in which this can operate. But it's a very interesting point that you raise because it's obviously a great, a great topic for, for debate and there's quite a lot of data that can be collected about it. Thank you. Another question. I have a question with which I've been working for a long time. Mam pytanie, z którym się zmagam od jakiegoś czasu. Na co dzień zajmuję się zaburzeniami psychicznymi w swojej praktyce i mam taką refleksję, że emocje, te, które, które pan jakoś nazywa, że są programami działania, które jakoś mobilizują do działania, są produktem ewolucji i że nie służyły jakoś przystosowaniu. I moje pytanie jest, na ile ten, te przystosowanie, które no kiedyś powstało dawno temu, prawda, we współczesnym świecie, nie, dla współczesnego człowieka, jest, no dalej, dalej dobrze mu służy, nie, czy, czy ten system, czy te programy dalej mu dobrze służą. No, jakie pan ma myśli na ten temat, czy pan się na ten temat zastanawiał, czy e, właśnie, no, tyle może. Dziękuję. Thank you very much. 
the, the question, which is very interesting, is given that all of these emotive uh, programs that result in feelings um, are the product of evolution and have been with us forever and ever, um, is it the case that they are still valuable for us human beings now, or are they just problems for our life? And once again, as with the, 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 the question of our um, moderator and organizer, uh, it's, it's the, the issue of rationality and the issue of the value of emotions now. In some cases, they're very good. In some other cases, not so good. It depends. For sure, we would not survive if we did not have this emotional apparatus available to us. It's absolutely critical for survival. It's critical for survival from very early on in the process. So I think that tomorrow we're gonna have a talk by K Dr. Karen Wynn, uh, in, in who works with young uh, children and, uh, and babies, and we know that there are things that are happening in the relation between the mother and the baby that are, you know, you can describe them as social, but they are fundamentally affective relations that are going on and that create the bond and that create the, 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 the relationship between the mother and the child or between the, the child and the father because they, those relations are there too. So from, from very early on, we are dependent on these emotions. Th there's no way we're gonna be rid of these emotions anytime soon, unless of course you destroy humanity first and you come up with something else um, that I don't want to think about. Okay, be before we move to the next question from the audience, I have a question from the internet chat. Internet chat. Uh, and here it is. Uh, as artificial intelligence is being developed and should in the near future not only reach but also surpass the level of human abilities, would you talk about, uh, about a homeostasis in the case of artificial intelligence? The question was posed by Hannah, but I, I don't believe it was your wife who, who formulated it. Okay, so the the, uh, the the idea that um, artificial intelligence will, will surpass, uh, will allow, will, will allow devices to surpass human intelligence is not difficult at all to conceive. What is difficult to conceive is that you can have organisms, artificial organisms, that will be human-like and intelligent, so that they can have you know, just, just the sheer scope of memory that will be available to artificial devices, which is far larger than what we can ever have, is already a huge promissory note in order to get great intelligence. It's not the solution, but it helps. So we're probably going to have creatures, artificial creatures, that are far more intelligent than we are. The issue is, do those creatures have characteristics that are like the characteristics of humans so that they can be human-like. And that's where the doubts are. And then in terms of homeostasis, we get to the critical issue. Homeostasis makes sense if you have a living organism that is vulnerable and that is at risk. That's the sense of it. If you, d if you do not have an organism, of course you can have an artificial organism made of silicone and steel and plastic and whatnot. If their organism is not subject to risk and is not going to decay its life, then there's no need for homeostasis. Then it's the same thing, what is the homeostasis of this table? Well, if you don't kick it, if you don't throw it and break it with a hammer, it will survive. Does it have homeostasis? I don't see the point of making, of, of making the statement. It, it, it's not, homeostasis is connected with life and life is defined by the presence of risk, the presence of the possibility of decay and death. That's what defines it. And I find it very charming when people go through great um, 
the iterations of the thought of uh, immortality. There are people that are very interested now in creating immortality for humans. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor, provided you can live immortally and happy and healthy. If we're not going to live to age 850, sick and with Alzheimer's disease, I'm all in favor of it. The question is that the, 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 the way in which we define most of what we've been talking about tonight is predicated on the existence of life and of life having risk and being vulnerable and therefore there being a point of termination. On the other hand, I'm perfectly aware of the fact that because we yearn for things that go beyond what we had when we started the march of civilization, um, you know, millions and millions of years ago, why not dream of it? I don't have anything wrong. I don't find anything wrong with that. The same way I don't find anything wrong with the idea of reducing diseases and having people be happier than they were and without diseases. And without a doubt, there's a possibility of increasing longevity. In fact, longevity is already increasing remarkably. The question is how do you manage all that and don't fall into the risks and, uh, and, and awful aspects of amoral behavior that we have had in other times in history in which people have thought about socially engineering life for the future. That's a, a very big problem. And all of these are great things to discuss, especially in a nice evening in Krakow, in a museum, and all of that. But they're things for which we do not have an answer. But there's nothing wrong with thinking about it and knowing what, knowing what we don't know. So maybe we will have an answer for the next question of the gentleman sitting in the front row. Okay. And then we should stop because there's that glass of wine that Indeed. Uh, that's in my prospects. <coughs> my somatic markers exactly. my somatic say markers. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, at the end of your lecture and also in your uh, response that you have now uttered, uh, you, you have mentioned death as something important. And uh, my question is simple. How is, what is the function of death uh, within the self uh, preserving, self-optimizing, self-regulatory organism and embodied one if death means the possibility of some presupposed ultimate uh, resol resolving of the, of the organism that is based upon embodiment and therefore how, how can we even speak of homeostasis if this uh, model uh, no longer applies and uh, there is nothing to regulate. Uh, so how, the, this perspective, how does it, right, the so representation of this perspective, how it influences the whole system? So you're, uh, let me see if I understand your question, because I'm not sure I do. So what you're saying is that if you have an artificial system, it does not make sense to talk about a mystery. No, I'm rather interested in, in life systems that uh, have the presupposition of its own uh, dissolution which is represented as death. Therefore, what is, if, if the goal of a life system is to uh, achieve homeostasis and somehow self-regulate, the possibility of death means that there is an ending of, of this process. Oh yeah, sure. So, so the, but, it, but it has to do with the conditions of that organism. So you, you, you have, a, 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 if I understand your, your, your question, it's like this. So you have an organism that is designed, quote unquote, because it's of course it's been designed by evolution to be in a certain way. And the, the organism has been sort of optimized first by natural biological evolution, by natural selection that did not take into account our own intervention. And now it's actually been designed in partnership with cultural evolution. Don't forget that in addition to biological evolution, we have a way as human beings in a culture to select certain things. When people choose certain political parties or when they choose certain kinds of art and certain kinds of music and certain kinds are extinguished, we are engaging in, in selection, but the selection is at cultural level. So 
we, with the cultural evolution that we now have, we have a way of intervening in the process that was totally automated prior to that. And, and that's where you can actually pose a question such as, what does it mean to die when you have, in the context of homeostasis? Well, what it means is that as arranged by evolution, our organisms are finite. And at a certain point, it is no longer possible to cope with the wear and tear of certain aspects of it. For example, there are certain aspects in our gene uh, systems, well, some, which is debatable, they have to do with telomeres, in the, the, the certain parts of the genes that actually shorten and get old. And those could be responsible for the death and for the sort of clocking of death. And for the fact that there are certain, you know, right now it's, it's quite possible that we can be made to survive, say, to uh, age 125 or so. But there seems to be certain barriers to how long it can be pushed. But there may not be. It may be that it goes beyond that. But the whole point, what you're uh, raising in your question, is the, the relative conflict between what the, the biology gave us and what we that now have the possibility of understanding the biology and having a say-so want to have. You see, this, this very human conflict between what you find in humanity and what you want to have for humanity. And it's perfectly legitimate to think about immortality and to think about going to, to uh, different planets and colonizing life. It's a question of how realistic it is and how humanistic it is. Because what you, what you want, you want to have science, you want to have great progress, but at the same time you want to preserve humanity because that's something that, at least for the time being, we cherish and we consider an important value. And if we want to do that, then there are other questions to be asked. But thank you, it's a very interesting question. Pretty complicated, but interesting. Okay. And I think we should probably stop here. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Professor Damasio, thank you very much. Szanowni Państwo, chciałem jeszcze zaprosić na kolejne wydarzenia festiwalowe. To dopiero pierwszy dzień. Jesteśmy z Państwem do niedzieli. Szczegóły w katalogu festiwalowym i na naszej stronie internetowej. Zapraszam.